So, one, I can't believe everyone in the approval process let me get away with this title. Um, but yeah, I'm super psyched to be up on stage for my first time. I'm Serena. We're going to talk about how UHG does uh, security logging. And I want to thank all of the organizers, sponsors, volunteers that make all of this stuff work. Shout out to the AV people. I had some issues with my slides this morning and had to fix them. All right, so who is Optum? Because some people aren't super familiar and aren't super plugged into the healthcare space. So kind of the short version is we're the healthcare, we're the technology healthcare services providers that make up United Health Group. Then you're probably more familiar with United Healthcare. That's the, like the payer insurance bit. Then UHG, United Health Group, that's just the parent company. And then about me, um, interned at Optum back in 2016. Um, started full time at, after I graduated in 2017. Uh, first rotation came in through the technology development program, so you do two six month rotations. It's kind of up on tier two help desk, doing password resets, um, you know, provisioning user accounts, learn a lot of empathy for how the underbelly of IT. Then uh, another six month rotation, ended up working with Heather Mickman's group, um, where I was like doing Kafka streams development. Then I got super into Prometheus because we were having issues with our streams. And at the end, uh, one of the people's like, oh yeah, you did good SRE work. And I'm like, that's the word for what I'm doing. Awesome. <laughs> um, then when it came to final placement, my old boss, who I worked with during my internship, said, hey, come back to security. Uh, we're doing a bunch of Kafka stuff, and we need to get off the ground. And I said, eh. you know, launches into this whole, you know, very long spiel. And I kind of said, I was sold five minutes in, but it seemed rude to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of my whole thing is platform developer, SRE, alphabet soup job titles. But I prefer just plain old vanilla sysadmin. There's nothing dirty about it. I keep, the, I keep the lights on, and that brings me joy. So like all engineering endeavors, what problems are we actually trying to solve? Define them. So we had long login just times. Like it took tens of minutes. Sometimes jobs would fail. And it just took a while. And someone said, could we make it faster? Yes, we can. Um, inconsistent log formats, the old process, probably touch on it later. It used to be you get into a queue, have people write custom regex parsers, and there you go. And then some of the smart connectors just do, do their whole thing. Except, believe it or not, people writing regex doesn't scale when you're at hundreds, hundreds of applications. And sometimes the log format might just slightly change and break all your regex. Um, <laughs> Also vendor lock-in, we kind of got like commercial logging system and uh, it was kind of hard to get data out of it. And we we're like, oh, let's see what we can do about that. So kind of outline for today, I'm going to talk about your enterprise-wide log schema is, uh, and how to sell that, because boy, asking people how to change their logging is <laughs> difficult. <laughs> um, then we'll dive into re Real-time, near real-time, depends how you want to define time. Um, after that, go over how a small team of few people, because we used to be four, now we're around eight, thankfully. Um, and uh, ev go over everything, we stood up everything, and then give you some tips so you can learn from my mistakes. So we got our schema right up here. We got eight required fields, but we have a bunch more, but these are our bare minimum. So device.vendor, that's your, if it's your in-house app, that's going to typically be your company name. So for me, yeah, it'll probably be Optum. Then your product, what's your application called? So another example is I'm actually collecting logs from my own pl Kafka platform. So vendor, all right, that'll be Apache. Don't have a vendor relationship, but close enough. Device.product, Kafka, Zookeeper, etc. And then Host name, just host name, plain text, pretty normal. Device IPv4, now this is where it gets a bit interesting because we used to get weird dotted decimal parsing issues. So we just said, okay, okay, okay. 
Convert it, to a, convert it to the long integer format. Not a string, just give us the raw number that the computer actually cares about. We'll convert it for our analysts later. And then a couple of validation rules. Don't set us 0.0.0.0. .0 that just tells us you're binding to all interfaces, which, yeah, you typically do. And that gives us zero context. 127.0.0.1. I don't care. Local host, local to whom? <laughs> um, Timestamp. Um, we do milliseconds after the Unix epic because we used to get weird timestamp formats in all strings. Some people don't feel like putting time zone offsets. Why? I... So we just kind of said, okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. Give us Unix time. We don't care about time zone offsets now. Message, human readable string. Describe what's going on. And then application ID. So we have an internal database we use at UHG just to keep tabs on all of our apps. It's mainly used for like billings, chargebacks, et cetera. But for our use case, since every application has a unique ID, we get to uh, keep tabs on them. And then when they start sending us bad logs, we get to go and say, hey, could you make me make a couple of small changes? Pretty please. And then application.name, more the human readable name that's just up in our CMDB, config management database. I'm pretty sure everyone's got one of those. And I forgot to cover at the beginning. So, because we get this asked this a lot, what is an actual security event? <laughs> and uh, things we're mainly interested. We want logins, log offs, session expiration. Uh, give us the query that's ran on a database. Don't give us all the data, because some people say, well, this returns like a thousand, thousands of results. And that's like, no, 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 no. Keep the, keep the logs nice and small. We're, run, we're shipping it over the network. Um, API calls, and basically these are the bare minimum that you need for your security analyst to actually make sense of what's going on. Obviously, have more, like response codes, AP, like the actual API endpoints, that'd be all great stuff to have. And then, why you want a schema? So, like I said earlier, it's hard to parse infinitely many formats. Like, I'm getting our Kafka and Zookeeper logs. Yes, I wrote a ton of regex. I got real good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's not fun. So we're just kind of telling people, you know, doing the whole shifting security left and just say, uh, please log our way. Please, pretty please. So it's all nice and standardized. And kind of the issue is, like, now we're trying to get the whole company on the standard or structured logging train. Um, and the issue is, going to be honest, I'm writing my automation stuff. I don't think about logging. I rarely think about logging. They're just there to help me out, try to figure out what's going wrong with my app. But main thing, it gives, it really helps your security folks actually have, like, a common common enterprise-wide schema. So like every event looks pretty similar beyond like your typical message fields. Now, Avro. We use Apache Avro because I like me some data compression and the encoding um, hard schema. So when people send us stuff that doesn't conform, we just say, well, you don't meet our schema. Goodbye. Off to dev null you go. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we, we just we used to take in whatever stuff people sent us, and it turned out, yeah, it's kind of hard to make secure, like do real good alerting use cases off of those. And then, since everything's nice coming in standardized, you don't have to do a whole lot of cleanup. Doesn't necessarily mean the data coming in is high quality, but well, we haven't quite automated that bit yet. But but, but everything's coming in; it's looking good. Now. All right, so you go, go up and say, all right, yeah, hey. Your security folks go up to your developers and say, yeah, I want you to log our way. OK. And oh, and by the way, if you don't conform to our scheme, we're just going to drop your messages. <laughs> OK. So you're asking your developers to do a lot of work. And yeah, it takes time. So being security, yeah, we get to go, go out, make a security policy, made a change, and say, yeah. Developers, you must log this way. But on the flip side, with a whole kind of heavy-handed mandate like that is, 
you do need to acknowledge it takes time and help them out along the way. So a couple slides, kind of next couple, I'll have some screenshots of the tools we're using to kind of give some feedback to our developer community. And, uh, but yeah, again, be really patient. This stuff does not happen overnight. Um, and we've had to make some exceptions and meet people in the middle. Like for example, um, I didn't know mainframe applications don't have IP addresses. I cannot believe that that's a thing. But again, I'm not a mainframe developer. Um, they also don't have the constant, you know, they don't have Unix time. There's no uh, nice COBOL statement that just gives you that. And uh, coolest thing I saw, and I kind of want to get access to their source code just to look at it, we had COBOL people say, okay, fine, we can do structured logging. We'll write out all the string handling to log in JSON in COBOL. <laughs> <laughs> I am both amazed and slightly terrified of, our, of mainframe developers. <laughs> that is super creative and awesome. So one of the things, we had one of our devs. Uh, I don't know if Kyle's uh, wa watching at, the t at this time, but shout out to you, dude, because this validator is amazing. <laughs> you know, so people are saying, hey, how do, we how do we actually know if our messages are valid? Well, you're doing your development, you're just gonna go you know, print off a couple log messages, copy, paste, pop it in here, and we'll tell you, yeah, this is good. Send it to us. And then we'll give you a couple warnings. So, like, this is from my local development parsing out my Kafka logs, and, you know, yells at me saying, oh, your host name doesn't resolve over DNS. Well, it's a local machine running on my own thing, so, yeah, 100% expected, but it's very helpful. Then we got our customer view. So, Giving access back to security data is a little, because we're having everyone come in, go into a common topic. We're looking to change it, give everyone their own topics. Um, it's a little hairy. So ideally, right now, we're kind of, our solu current solution is, yeah, look, we can give you the counts, but we can't actually show you the text, because we don't current, we lack the means to give fine-grained access control. We're working on it, it's on the roadmap. And this is just, again, coming off of our validation streams and kind of telling people, like, hey, if it, make, if it passes the validation stream, we got it. You don't got to worry about it after that. The rest of that, that's an us problem. Now, streaming, why should you stream your logs? So being security, I love thinking of the worst possible things that can happen. <laughs> so should the worst happen, heavens forbid, it doesn't happen, an attacker popped your box, got root on it, and is like going messing up all your services. And uh, sure, you can't stop them from logging, but if you're streaming them off the compromised endpoint, you can at least get your whatever data, essential log data is on there before um, they shut that off. Or even if they don't know what's running. You get to watch the, you know, watch and see, oh, yep, that's 100% attacker. Let's go shut that down. And then another, another thing, streaming real time. If you start noticing something weird going on and the, your people in the sock are saying, yeah, there's something up, you can lower that time to detection nice, get that down, save the day, get a nice, there you go, from, from, the, from your head and everything's great. Good guys win in all that jazz. So um, Kafka, super basic. We're all using this. It's, there's no secret sauce. This is just kind of the way that we're doing it. Super common. It's resilient. Um, set your replication factors good. And you, it's got some pretty bu good built-in resiliency, even though we'll cover later that, yes, it's resilient, but sometimes you might have fun Kafka gremlins. like. I've been dealing with this week because they love to act up whenever I'm away. <laughs> and then the other nice thing is why I like Kafka, the docs are amazing. Everyone's written, everyone ha and their moms has written a blog post on data streaming with Kafka, which is great because when you're a newbie operator like myself and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, but the collective wisdom of the internet just says, oh, here are some sane configs, or you kind of go with the inner source route, and there's already a group of people running Kafka, and you just say, I may or may not have borrowed a couple and just forked a couple Ansible roles. 
because be super lazy. Um, and also, we ha so far, we haven't hit anything in scale. I was kind of sarcastic, I'm like, whoa, we have a whopping one meg a second going through right now. <laughs> um, we'll hopefully be getting more, but we're kind of just started out and getting our stuff stable in production. And then, again, finally talking about how do people actually send us logs? Um, so we got a couple options that you and the whole family will enjoy. You got a, you can just send them straight to our Kafka topic. Um, we're a pretty heavy chef work, um, chef shop, so we just kind of wrote up, again, Kyle wrote up a chef cookbook, and it's like, oh yeah, we'll install FileBeat. And uh, yeah, just plop your logs in this directory, or you can go use our attribute manager, set your log directory, make sure it's formatted, we'll take care of it from there. Um, also, we're pretty heavy Java shop, so we had, again, since we were pretty small, we had kind of one of our internal teams kind of think contracting, but, you know, internal, and kind of commissioned a, hey, could you guys build us, like, a nice little Java package so people can just call all of those methods and build our logs and just give them a send method? And then, again, and it'll handle, like, IP address conversion, you've got your uh, epic time in milliseconds, we'll have to revisit that in 2038, but um, that's a long ways away. <laughs> um, and then finally say, well, I don't do Java, and I need a little more parsing than FileBeat can give me. That's just fine. We don't really care. Send it to our normal direct producer topic. Um, people say, hey, I'm supporting a vendor app that's just off the shelf. I can't change this logging source code. That's fine. We personally recommend FluentD. Um, for my use case, I needed something super small, lightweight, that had some heavy parsing capabilities, and due to our constraints and the pain of installing Ruby, I said, okay, I'll just use FluentBit. Just do, again, write out tons of regex, it'll be fine and whatever heavy lifting I need to do, uh, uh, Google can teach me Lua in a, in a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> then Kafka Streams. I love the Kafka Streams API. It's super nice and fun to work with. And basically, nice thing, Kafka. It's just a message queue. That's all it is. It's super small, it's super Basic, but there's a lot of cool things you can do to it. Multiple producers, different consumer groups. So, and then, you know, we start getting our data nice, fast, snappy. And, you know, this has lowered our latency in the orders of tens of minutes, and now we're down to, I'm trying to think of the imp actual empirical numbers, but five or less. And then, again, really hammering down on this point. Lower your time to detection. It'll be great. Get those alerting use cases, stream, like stream, you know, analytic streams. Awesome, I support that. And then most of our stuff runs in Kubernetes because I manage multiple virtual machines. I wish I, I dislike and don't wish I didn't have to be on virtual machines because you can mess something up weird with a state. But yeah, this is the way of life with stateful workloads. And then kind of our streams kind of just fell into the microservices architecture. We got one, do the validation. If people, if that reports that, hey, your stuff passed our validation, as far as the developers are concerned, that's it, that's your responsibility. The rest of it's on my team. Then we got another one, we got a nice big security data lake. We run a bunch of analytics on all of our endpoint logs from because you've got your firewalls, switches, network appliances, they're all quite noisy. Um, so we got our validation, got, then we got our Elasticsearch and our data lake, we got Hadoop, HDFS. So it's like, all right, one, go put your stuff into Elastic, the other, go write it to Hadoop, and people will start messing around with Spark, and we'll see if what, what cool things we can do. Now, this is the section of do as I say, not as I did. So I have to operate in my organization's DMZ. 
I can't talk to the public internet. So fortunately, we got some basic, you know, we're running RHEL. We got some nice servers that have the base system packages, but uh, fortunately, uh, they can't just say, oh yeah, just yum install Kafka. It'll be fine. Um, so interesting thing is, so we have a vendor product that kind of mimics the S3 API, which turns out has both a DMZ and a core endpoint. Awesome. Let's mess around and, oh great, I got my whole, whole yum repo up in S3, accessible in both core and DMZ. Amazing. Got to pa package the stuff myself, but eh, hey, I'll take it over a tarball. Um, so, order of operations, going back to the DMZ, this stuff matters. So, do your bootstrapping, non-Kafka stuff, like base playbooks I run. I'm gonna provision some TLS certs, set my time zone to UTC, um, install node exporter. I'm kind of a, personally, I'm a Prometheus kind of gal, that's just what I learned first. Then, gotta add the node to your firewall rules first. Traffic won't be going to it because Kafka's not installed, but has to be in your rules. Then you can add it to the cluster, and then optionally, oh yeah, go and, go and rebalance your partitions. Make sure to spread, that, spread out that load. Because I, I uh, accidentally switched the steps because I added, it to, added the node to the cluster, rebalanced, and I was like, ah, I can just wait. It's not like I'll be a leader of partitions or anything. Oh boy, was I wrong. <laughs> That was, uh, I learned that mistake the hard way, and then clients were all complaining, hey, I can't talk to the leader of this partition. When I'm like, look at my dashboards, like, what do you mean, and the cluster's up and, oh. <laughs> Firewall, neato, all right. And then kind of package up everything nicely. RPMs are great, I recommend, there's a great old plugin I'm using um, called Nebula's OS package, it works. Great, super simple for me to use. Then infrastructure change management kind of gets into some interesting bits where you know I'm supporting a health insurance company. So believe it or not, our peak season, you know, got your Medicare open enrollment, individual. Everyone loves that end of the year where you're signing up for your health plans and you just want to tell the employer, hey, I just want the one I had last year. But uh However, since peak season, we value stability and things are maybe a little difficult because we got change blackout dates and working around odd hours. So big thing is just do as much as you can outside of that time because <laughs> it's trying to set up all this infrastructure during our peak season and it took a little while. And also try to, you know, build in observability. Ah, perfect, next point instrumenting all the things. Um, this isn't a super pain point. Well, actually, no, I was kind of trying to say, all right, got to ship out features, get the, Kafka, get the cluster stood up, get everything working, and then realized I have zero idea what my Kafka cluster's doing. Okay. And there was a whole sp sprint where I was just like, all right, I'm doing, I'm just getting metrics. I'm gonna go grab, go grab node exporter, JMX exporter, get a Prometheus out in the DMZ, get it all added to our Grafana instance as data sources, and it's like, great, I got some help, I can see all the health, everything looks good. Um, now we're getting logs out of our platform stuff, so we're running, again, Kafka, Zookeeper, um, Confluence open source schema registry to handle all of our Avro and make sure everything's nice and compatible whenever we make changes. We're also getting logs from our attribute manager because, yeah, we sure would love to know who is changing log directories on people's boxes. Um, I think that's kind of all we're collecting right now. Um, still working on setting up, you know, tracing to see what people see. Um, cool thing is, we inadvertently kind of, kind of rolled our own. Um, not super great for tracing use case, which has more details, but we have a heartbeat generator because we're all talking about, we, you know, we want to see, hey, what does the customer see when we write messages? So I think it's like every five seconds. Testing, testing. Um, 
and it sends a message through. We get and we set up a watch or an elastic search. Most of the time, ah, I got my message in a five minute period. I'm happy. Sometimes it says, oh, I am a message short, which nor normally means, ah, just took a little while to get through. Being a small team, what a blessing and a curse. Because it was nice, and we used to all be out in Minnesota, but now we got, let's see, Kyle's, we got some people out in Colorado, we got people out in Maryland, now Carolina, because big global company, we're all distributed everywhere. But, uh, but, you know, we all can talk to each other, like, say I broke the Kafka cluster, and, you know, can say, hey, I think something's wrong. Um, however, be realistic with your expectations. You know, we used to be, again, only four people. We just said we can't realistically do an on-call rotation. Like, yes, this is super important, but we're just not adequately staffed. Because if we're all on call, then yes, we'll all burn out, and then none of us will be keeping an eye on the platform, and then that's just worse than no support. And then automate everything. I'm super lazy. I was thinking, okay, I can just go hand patch and look at my inventory list in Ansible and say, oh, that's, oh dear, that's 40 servers. Yeah, no, okay. Code is going to solve that. Big thing, no is a complete sentence. Everyone wants, you know, you got someone saying, hey, I, you know, important person, hey, I want a super, I want this feature in, like, right now. And it's like, hey, we're working on some stability stuff, trying to reduce our tech debt, paying that down. And it's like, hey, listen, we hear you, and I know we have a lot of people, you know, dev community saying, hey, we want, like, some limited access back to our logs. And it's like, yep, we hear you. We got that feature request in loud and clear. Um, however, you've got to have your manager, the manager's, your boss's boss, and boss's boss's boss, you know, say, yes, I respect this team's autonomy. So, depending on where you are, your mileage may vary. Then, final thoughts is. Uh, so this is, uh, so in college, my professor, when I took digital signal processing, it used to be, once upon a time, I was thinking, ah, yes, I'll be an electrical engineer and do si embedded systems. He always concluded every lecture with, so this is, these are the main points that when your mother asks you at the dinner table what you have learned today, this is what you've learned today. So this is what you go back, tell management and your team. Enterprise-wide schema, like, and acknowledge that, yes, it will take time. There will be pushback. Two, stream everything. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot more network bandwidth now, and as such, we've all kind of gotten accustomed to, I want that web page to load up right now. Similarly, yes, I want that log data right now. And then, be patient. Get your devs involved. Like, actually, we kind of start, started doing the inner source thing, and we actually got more devs kind of looking at our Java package and saying, hey, this was a good first cut, here are some resiliency things, and hey, are you open to a PR? Yes, I love a PR. Or also on our schema, like we have people, you know, you want a feature request? We're on Git, you know, we have all of our repos public on our internal GitHub Enterprise instance. Come talk to us and in our Slack channel, we don't bite. If you have questions, please ask, because we would much prefer you to ask a question and uh, to get answers so you can log better. Then, you know, we all win. Kind of the main thing is, like, you know, it's DevOps days, and also as someone who's kind of development operations and security, it's kind of nice to realize that, yes, we all should be friends. We're all on the same team. We don't want... No one wants to be in the news. <laughs> that's like yeah, that's the thing. Like can't be in opposition. We're all like on the same side here. And then kind of some links. So if you're looking at this on GitHub, I put the link out on Twitter last night. Um, got a PDF which PSA. If you're using Reveal JS and speaking at a conference, export to PDF. Do yourself that favor. Um, speaker notes, Twitter, I'm at Serena TD. Yes, that's how that, that last name's pronounced. I love weird German last names. 
GitHub Lady Serena. Thank you, everyone.